<laughs> All right, good evening, everybody. We are so glad that you are here joining us this evening for Robin Solar. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for, for coming. We really appreciate it. My name is Emily Kropchewski. I am the site manager here at the Washington County Heritage Center. If you haven't visited us yet, we are open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. We also have the Warden's House Museum that is on the other side of Stillwater. They are open Thursday through Sunday. Um, it's really, really fun to check that out, too. And uh, Hay Lake School up in the Scandia, Marina, and St. Croix area. That is our third site. They are open Friday through Sunday, so lots of chances to visit us, but this is the only one with air conditioning, so I'm just saying. <laughs> the others are great, too. Um, so a couple of quick things before we take off and uh, let Robin take off the show here. Uh, if you don't mind silencing your cell phones, just double check, even if you think you've silenced it, double check that. Um, for those of you on Zoom, welcome to you as well. Um, if you don't mind just making sure that your audio is off, that would be very, very appreciated. And questions for Robin, you can put those in the chat and I'll point out where that is as well. Um, so let me just uh, quickly introduce Robin. Um, she is a longtime member of WCHS, completed research for this topic as a volunteer for the National Park Service. Her project provided park rangers with detailed content to share with visitors and to augment an exhibit at the St. The St. Croix <laughs> National Scenic Riverway Visitor Center in St. Croix Falls. Have any of you guys been up there? Questions? Yeah, close it. Her research brought her to the National Pearl Button Museum in Muscatine, yes. Iowa, and several local museums, plus many hours at a microfilm reader reading old newspaper stories on clamors and the pearl button business. So we're very excited to have her here with us tonight, and welcome you to Rabbit. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me, and my name is Robin Stoller, as Emily said, and I live in Stillwater Township. And this is uh, research I did several years ago as a volunteer, Emily mentioned, and I'm so glad to be able to share this with you all tonight. I will say, for me, this was an extremely unique, if not short-lived, uh, piece of history about our beautiful St. Croix Valley and beyond. So I hope that you find it very interesting. Tonight... We are going to talk about several different elements of the pearl button industry, including what is mother of pearl? How did this whole button boom get started? What was muscle mania? And what did the clamors do? And we'll talk about uh, what that is defined as a clamor. Uh, we'll get into a little bit of the pearl fever that accompanied this whole period of time. And there could be a completely separate presentation about making pearl buttons. I've tried to condense it to five slides in the interest of time. Uh, but that, that's fascinating, the, the whole process of making pearl buttons. And then we'll close out with the industry's decline and its legacy and the impact to muscles. I do want to, before I get into the slides, there's a couple of people I did want to thank, especially for all the help that they gave in putting this content together. And one of them is uh, Deb Rose from the Minnesota DNR. Another is Mark Rasmussen, who is a member of the Historical Society. And also the folks down at the Muscatine National Button Museum. Yes, there is such a thing. And also the folks up at the Visitor Center, the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway. Uh, those folks were excellent. So this is, mainly their content that we'll be looking at tonight. So let's get started. And I wonder how many of you know that it wasn't that long ago, our buttons had a beautiful, shiny, iridescent quality to them. And that's because in the period of the mid 1900s and before, many buttons were made of mother of pearl. And I just love this photo of the pink uh, buttons, which includes a belt buckle, but you can see that, you know, they were colored as well at, at this period of time. So mother of pearl is that very strong, iridescent inner shell of certain mollusks, and that includes fresh and saltwater mussels, and that shell layer, let me see peak here, and we'll pass around a couple later, but this inner shell layer 
is called Naker. Some, some folks um, call it Naker, but this is that inner shell layer that comprises uh, what Stefan does mother of pearl. And here in the photos on this slide, you can see a couple of examples of how beautiful these shells are. And mother of pearl, I'm sure many of you probably have in your own personal jewelry collections, things that have mother of pearl, um, <laughs> pearl necklaces, maybe some watches or inlays and decorative objects. Mother of pearl has been used for a long time, for centuries. It's not just been in buttons. Well, before the late 1800s, most of the buttons here in America came from Europe. And of course, they were all beautiful, but something started to happen in the late 1800s that caused that importing of buttons to stop. And that was the U.S. Tariff Acts. And there were several, but the one that dealt the final death knell to importing um, pearl buttons here was this 1890 Tariff Act, which really made it very cost prohibitive to import buttons. And can you imagine for a one inch diameter shell button paying in today's money, they're almost $39.50. That was the tax. So you can imagine that was pretty much the end of European buttons coming here. So that really set the stage for our US button boom. And as you can imagine, we had raw materials right at hand from the Mississippi and its tributaries that became the primary raw material for buttons. And this gentleman, John Beckley, I hope I say his name right, he's credited with starting this entire button boom, pearl button boom in the US. He came from Germany, he was 33, he came, you see, in 1887 three years before the final Tariff Act of 1890 that kind of squashed uh, the European buttons coming. And he was born into a button-making family. He knew how to use a lathe. He was well-versed in the craft. And you can see from the photo, he wasn't just using shells. Do you see what else he's got here? <laughs> Those are big horns. So he was using horns and bones. So this is a gentleman who knew a lot about the button business. While he was in Germany, somebody sent him a box of American muscle shells. And he thought they were the best. He loved the, the thick layer of, of the nacre that he saw in those um, muscles that had been sent to him. And he remembered that box of muscles. And when his business failed in Europe and he moved here, <clears throat> he began searching <clears throat> for that raw material. He first came to work as an Iowa farmhand. And he recalled that the muscle shells he got in the box were from 200 miles west of the Mississippi. Now you tell me, does Illinois <laughs> look like 200 miles west of the Mississippi? No, but I think he was just looking anywhere, right? He was working as a farmhand in Iowa and the Mississippi was there. He probably was down close um, to the town of Muscatine, which will play a role, big role later. And of course you can see here, the legend flames he found his first muscle shell when he cut his foot while bathing in an Illinois river. Poor guy. <laughs> and his quote is sort of pitiful because he says, yeah, I, I, at last I found what I had been looking for, yet there was the problem before me. I had no money and I didn't know the language. So he was, he was trained, he found the raw material that he was having some issues getting a new business started. Initially, nobody would loan him money, but he did build a lathe here while he worked as a farmhand, gathered shells and started to cut and polish them. 
started selling them and somebody who had money and was willing to invest put the money up for him to start his first uh, U.S. freshwater pearl button factory down in Muscatine, Iowa. So look at the year, 1891. He had been here three years before this factory opened up. And I think for somebody who didn't know the language well and had capital <coughs> concerns initially, he probably did pretty well for that three-year period getting started. And that really was the kickoff to muscle mania in the United States. I did put in here a couple of data points of the numbers of people that the U.S. Fisheries Division of our federal government believed were uh, clamming. That was the term. People that fished for mussels were called clamors. And so in 1897, it was estimated there were over 300. But look, a year later, the estimate jumped to over 1,000. And that's clamors on the Mississippi and all of its tributaries, including up where we are here. And then in 1919, over a thousand licenses. And I should mention during this period of what are considered the boom years of the um, pearl button industry, look at how short lived that is. It's 19 years, 1897 to 1916. It continued after, of course, 1916, but there was a, a huge decline. Um, but I was going to say, during those years, states started to require licenses of people who were fishing for mussels. And so that's why we know in 1919, there were over a thousand licenses issued in Wisconsin and 169 in Minnesota. And you can see here, this, this is estimates. I think the U.S. Fisheries uh, Division had a lot of issues trying to even estimate the number of tons harvested, but it was somewhere between 40 and 60,000 tons harvested annually during this period. Um, do you all know what a mussel is? Okay, I, I didn't, so I, I put it in here. Bivalve mollusk with a hinge holding together the two hard shells, and it has no head or eyes, and it has a foot to help guide it along the water's floor. It does prefer streams, rivers, and lakes that have wind-driven currents, which allow water, uh, food to come in and oxygen and carry away waste. They can live for decades. And this slide I made before I read an article, yes, some populations average over 50 years of age mussels, but I just read an article a couple months ago that two years ago, up north of St. Croix Falls, a bed of mussels where th there were biologists doing research and they found a bed of mussels that they estimate was 90 to 100 years old. So they live long lives. And here in our St. Croix watershed, uh, we have over 40, what this was a surprise to me, uh, living both in the St. Croix watershed, including the Namakagan River, and they have some unusual names, but <laughs> perhaps fitting, especially the spectacle case, that was the species that they found up north of, uh, by St. Croix, but just north of the dam, uh, spectacle case. So of course, Mussels are providing food for fish and wildlife. They help to clean the water by filtering out particles. And they're used as a barometer to you know, understand a river or lake's health. So we have some very interesting mussels here in our local area. But let's get back to buttons because not all mussels were created equal when it came to button making. And there were key characteristics you needed to make a button. They had to be thick enough. They had to be a, a uniform color. They had to be certain toughness. And 
the preferred color being white, but cream colored was okay too. So these were the characteristics that muscles needed to have to be good in button making. And here are the top six in our beautiful St. Croix River Valley. Aren't really, aren't they beautiful when you look at the, that iridescent white? It's just so striking to me. So these would be the muscles that the clamors would be looking for is their fishing. And how did they fish for muscles? This to me looks like a lot of work. So some might have used tongs or rakes. And here's a, a picture of the scissors uh, rake, which would have been used in water under 15 feet deep. I don't know about you, but the idea of taking something with that long of a handle and getting down into the water over the boat edge and lifting it up, my back would be <laughs> done for. Um, so they use tongs, more shallow water, and then they also would use this shoulder rake, and that could be used in slightly deeper water. But again, think of the labor because you would be holding this over your shoulder, um, this picture here, and they um, place it upstream, anchor the boat, and then the fishermen would slowly move that rake towards them and then pull it up with, with hopefully a full uh, basket of mussels. That just sounds like an awful lot of work. And it was. So this was their other choice for fishing. And it was a crow foot bar. And you can see here, this was about a, could have been six foot long or seven and a half foot long. And the way this worked, and you can see it had chains and hooks. So the muscles are lying typically open on the water's bottom but they're gonna clamp shut if there's some disturbance for an object. So these pro foot bars would be dragged along the bottom of the river or lake. And of course, that's going to be a disturbance and the muscle would clamp shut on these hooks. And then when the clamor felt that the bar was getting heavy, he would hoist it up by a rope and pick off the muscles. Aren't these great photos? I am so happy that the National um, Button Museum in Muscatine, they, they have just a wealth of photos. So that was the Crowfoot Bar. And the clamors loved this thing. They said it was reducing labor by about half over that shoulder rig, and it was cheap. The overall cost apparently, um, this was again from US Fisheries Information, would cost about $36 in 1914 to, to make a crow foot bar. It may have been their favorite, but it was by no means perfect. And the primary reason was, yes, a vast majority of muscles were taken with crow foot bars, but you can imagine this was a very indiscriminate way of fishing for muscles. And they would pull up the young ones along with the ones that could be used for buttons. And the young ones then would be either thrown back and injured and died or um, just died from um, being so disturbed through the use of this crow foot bar. So it might have been their favorite, but it certainly wasn't an optimal tool. The fishing of the mussels was not the only thing involved. And to me, this is the part of the process where I would have just said, no, thank you. I am not doing it. <laughs> you know, these people had to sell the shells. They could not sell the meat that was in the muscle. So they had to clean the muscles first, which involved a hooker. And I'm already going to picture, you know, what they're picked imagine the smell of 
winter or summer. They would then, after cooking, move the shells to a sorting table. And I guess they would pick out ones that might have not been suitable for selling. And then they would have their pile ready to sell. So clamors didn't just go into the water and fish. They had this piece of the process as well. And this is the part of the process to me that seems, well, it all seemed labor intensive. I mean, let's be honest. <laughs> um, so there are so many great photos, but of course you have to go and look at micro, micro film to see some of these. But here were two brothers uh, who did this for quite a number of years, Frank and Henry Blunk. And uh, <clears throat> Frank, and by the way, can you see? Yes, they were doing their planning up by, is it Pokagama? Of course, it's Pokagama. <laughs> Thank you. Pokagama. We'll see if I can say that again. <laughs> that goes on. But you can see, I thought this was so interesting because they weren't on the St. Croix River. They weren't even on the Snake River which feeds the same point. They were on a lake up by Pine City, getting their muscles. And Frank, this was a quote from a Pine City newspaper at the time, kind of talking about pricing, you know, $10 per ton at the beginning. Uh, later as demand went up, the price jumped to $25 a ton. I weighed this example, this is a, you know, half of a uh, muscle shell. And this weighed about five and a half ounces. So if, and, and there were many different species as now we know. So that would be, let's just say if a muscle, two shells was between 10 to 15 ounces. Um, and it was priced by the ton, you would need over 2000 muscle shells you know, to get the price per ton, which we'll see here later. It's just, it's amazing. Frank, Frank also, uh, I didn't put it on the slide, it was too much writing. He said, it was people from Iowa that started the craves. They came in droves in the fall and lived in tents along the shores of Lake. <laughs> We became good friends with one family. I can still remember the good pot one wife could make over a campfire. I would like to meet that woman. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was Frank and Henry up there at by Pine City. Here's Charlie clamming near uh, Grantsburg. Right? Grantsburg, yeah. Uh, a lot, he was along the river, Fox Landing, and you see his pile, which apparently he's already cooked and sorted. I, I can't tell exactly from the photo, but it has that appearance. And here you can see a photo of his boat with the short handled, the clamming rakes, with muscles visible in the bottom of his boat. So I think pictures are worth a thousand words. These are great. I did go to the history center because the uh, Minnesota DNR does, you can look up records. And so these were licenses issued in a two year period for people clamming on the St. Croix River, Snake River and that lake <laughs> um, from 17 to 1918. And look what they're using as their equipment. The Crowfoot bar almost exclusively. Uh, the rig would be something bigger. And I have a picture of um, one of those coming up. Look at their occupations and their ages. These were people, would you say, who maybe were just trying to supplement their income, right? Farmer. Um, there was a housewife who just thought, hey, why not? <laughs> Car factory laborer, machinist. I, I found this fascinating, but does anybody have recognized anybody? 
as a relative. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. It's over 100 years ago. So. <laughs> and just a quick snapshot to show you from the time that the boom period started to decline, which would have been after 1916, look at how much decrease there was in total shell, tons of shells taken for the state of Minnesota. So in 1917, there were over 2,700 tons of shells, but by 1921, it had dropped significantly. And the same with the licenses issued. So I, I just found that very interesting too, to tell the story of how this industry was very short lived. And here's that example of a scow or a rig. This was down on the Mississippi. And you see the barge. This thing is packed with shells. So they were often shipped on barges to the factories. Here's another barge, and I'm sorry it's dark. The photos <clears throat> weren't always that great, but this was Afton also in 1911 heaped with muscles. And believe it or not, people did this in the winter. And for some reason, they felt the people who were clamming at this time thought it was better because the shells somehow were less brittle for button cutting. But this as a way to fish for mussels really was viewed as unduly destructive because if they took out a muscle that was too small to sell, they would just let it freeze on, on the ice. So that's kind of a very sad component of this ice fishing for mussels. And we already talked about the fact that this was not a pleasant task. Winter or summer, the mussels were cooked to remove the meat. So only the shells would be sold. And I don't know, but even sometimes when I have made shrimp in my house as one seafood, I'm thinking something is just not right here. And I can't imagine this volume, the, these clamors, the volume that they were cooking on shore. The smell must have carried for four miles. Um, but it wasn't all wasted because I did read that farmers sometimes would use some of this meat to feed their hogs and poultry. So for whatever that is worth. And by the way, um, you notice the statement about the meat was usually thrown back after being checked for pearls. Um, and we'll talk about pearls in just a moment, but here are the shell prices over a period of time. And you can see how it jumped per ton, even in 1921, after the boom years were over. And that's probably because there were a lot of constraints put on um, people, lakes and rivers were closed uh, to try to help uh, the mussel beds get some rest. And I guess the demand was still there. So the price was up. Yes, the pearls. So picture yourself with that fire going on shore and you've got your ton of mussels that you cooked, the smell is everywhere and now the mussels have opened up and it's time for you to take out the meat. But before you just pitch the meat, you are gonna go through it by hand to search for pearls because this could be a big bonus for the clamor. And they all did this. And I love this story. This came from the Pearl Button Museum. There was a granddaughter who said her grandparents did this clamming. And she said, after boiling the mussels on shore, my grandparents would feel around the very hot mussel meat for pearls. When they found a pearl, they would put it in their mouth. This prevented the pearl from cracking, which sometimes happened 
when the outside temperature was cool, putting a pearl in their mouth allowed it to cool down more slowly. But my grandparents had a few blisters as a result. But there was a second reason that they put the pearls in their mouth. And that was to, and I'm quoting here, to hide them from bums and hobos <laughs> who would wander the riverbanks looking for pearls to steal. My grandparents said a number of ne'er-do-wells would walk up to them on the riverbank asking if they had had any luck finding pearls. And my grandparents would always reply, no, we've not had any luck today. <laughs> How oh, amazing. Um, so this is an example of some pearls or baroques, I guess that's the term for the slugs, the imperfect ones that were found along the St. Croix River. And here's, this is a photo from one of our members, uh, Mark Rasmussen. You know, this whole thing with the pearl button industry, it did finally, I think for a short time become known as the river's gold rush, because there was money to be made. And this picture, of course, was along the Mississippi of a family doing uh, muscle harvesting. But here's the numbers for the estimated industry value. And I just translated this into today's dollars. So it wasn't a small amount that was being made from this business. Okay, so now let's talk about how the buttons were actually made. We've talked about how they were, the muscles were fished, how they were uh, booked to remove the meat and pearls searched for, and now the shells needed to get to a factory. And so again, I won't go through these numbers, you can read them. You can see the huge jump in factories uh, from 1898 to 1912. Most of these places were called cutting shops where they just made the blanks. They didn't do the finished buttons. The finishing button factories were a very small percentage of overall shops. This is Muscatine, Iowa. It became known as the pearl button capital of the world. And is anyone else scared to death when you see these photos? Look at the belts that are just out in the open. And I mean, you can just tell there's dust everywhere. I think OSHA would just have, have <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and that's this one that's darker, of course, showing the man sitting by all these sacks of, sh of shells to be cut. This was not an easy, or, or very pleasant, I don't think, uh, job, these jobs. We did have at least one uh, button shop here in Stillwater. I found these two articles. I didn't even know we had a newspaper called the Stillwater Messenger. Um, but look at this. They were expanding in 1917. 16 more machines have been ordered. They were using 24. A good man can earn $20 a week. And you'll notice here, the article said the buttons were not finished here in Stillwater. The blanks were sold and shipped to Amsterdam, New York, where apparently then they were divvied up and sold to finishing shops. But this uh, pearl button company in town I didn't see it anymore in the city directories after, uh, after 1919. And then the Stillwater Gazette had reported that the Pearl Button plant got two rail car loads of clamshells in May. So this was clearly a very big business. And if um, I know if Brent was here, he would probably know where that place was. Because mm -hmm. I know I had spoken to him, but it's a few years ago. so. I don't remember. Um, I love this photo. This was a Pine City button factory. Do you see on their pants? <laughs> that's where they were grinding. It shows the 
the grinding or polishing marks, you know, they were, must have all been at the same table. <laughs> <laughs> this was another great photo. Um, back to the pearls. So this couple found a pearl near the button factory. It was enough to buy them a new car. <laughs> Don't they look like they're just all dressed up and <laughs> ready to go? There were also, of course, not to forget our friends across the river, um, factories in, it, I'm sure there were more cities, but these were, I found photos were Prairie du Chien and La Crosse. And you can see the one in La Crosse um, actually built a new plant with 40,000 square feet. So <clears throat> these were big, big plants to do the buttons. Okay, so the process in five slides or less. Um, step one, first getting them from the clammers, the fishermen, so they were hauled from boats and barges by wagons to the cutting uh, factories. And then boys were typically hired to sort the shells. Then they'd be soaked in barrels of fresh water for several days so they're less brittle. And then they'd be cut into links. And these photos, I think most of these came from Arunas Fisheries, one of them is Noah. But you know, this was a very tedious business. I'm gonna pass around so you can, um, some nice person left two of these. This is one I picked up in Muscatine at an antique shop. But I'm gonna pass these around so you can feel you know how smooth it is, and I give you one and one over here. Sure. <laughs> I'm gonna hold it up to the screen so our friends on Zoom can see. And in the days before <laughs> OSHA, I'm sure the dust was very irritating uh, for the people that were working there. So they would be cut into planks. And of course, as you can just see with these examples, there was a lot of waste. Um, some of the button cutters, they weren't experienced or they weren't you know, careful. They didn't efficiently cut the shells and that ended up with um, unnecessary waste. However, <clears throat> we'll see that there were some uses that uh, came to be popular with that waste material. But then step three would be grinding the blanks for even surfaces. Again, the photos tell the story. Uh, this one, especially to me, just, uh, it's frightening to think of these. Um, do I have the right word? Safety last. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, belts, yes? We're, we're just out in the open and you could easily, you could see many accidents happening. But in this step where they're grinding for the even surfaces, um, you know, you, you would be, each person would be holding the individual button next to an emery wheel. And I wonder if they were wearing gloves. We don't know. This was also where the holes were drilled for the thread as part of the um, grinding of the blanks. So then, Moving on, the polishing step. And so this was the step where they were polished to bring out that luster that kind of got lost in the grinding. And to do this, here you can see, they put the buttons into these big wooden kegs and add some chemicals, just again, picturing what that must have been like <laughs> uh, to enhance the luster. I like this picture in the middle because it shows you when they're blanks, how many different widths they were and how the amount of grinding must have been amazing. Okay, so that's the polishing step. And then the final step was the washing and the sorting and getting them sewn onto cards like we all know, uh, to sell. 
and you know you're welcome to come up after afterwards to look at these because these are vintage these these are from the era and i got these at uh, the muscatine uh, antique shop those are fun to look at okay the pay um i did also for you put this into today's dollars so uh like the mid-range foreman or the male shell cutter fifteen dollars a week today is 532 so that equates to twenty five thousand five hundred dollars annually the poor uh ladies who were sorting buttons at six dollars a week um, today that would be $213 or $10,000 a year. So that was not uh, a great salary for sure. But they look happy, don't they? <laughs> well, not to forget, there were other things made out of Mother of Pearl. And it wasn't just buttons, you know, there were all these other um, cuff links and, and um, cutlery handles and jewelry, belt buckles. And I'm going to ask, um, how many of you really think that that pin is like the best? Is that the coolest pin? I, I think that's so beautiful. And, and actually, I wonder if these would ever show up at a Goodwill somewhere. <laughs> Love that cutlery. Okay, so I mentioned that they did use the waste shell material, and this was a, a plant, I think, somewhere in Iowa, where it was a crushing plant, where they would take the defective blanks and any you know other waste. And here, it it says as part of the picture that this was converted into chicken feed and other useful products, including road building material stock food for hogs and even artificial marble manufacturing so it wasn't all just thrown out they did find other uses for the waste shell material but of course all good things must come to an end and as the muscle beds became depleted i'm surprised as early as 1898 the u.s fish and game commission advocated changes to preserve the industry and by the default also the mussels so they enacted some compulsory closings of rivers so that mussels could have a condition of rest <laughs> <laughs> and also in the states uh, laws were enacted to close certain rivers and lakes for periods of years also there were size limit regulations put in place so the small muscles would not be needlessly destroyed. And believe it or not, there was artificial propagation research uh, done to supplement these depleted muscle bed regions. But the decline was inevitable. And in the early 1900s, we've already seen there were laws enacted, this artificial propagation station got set up in Fairport, Iowa. In the 20s, the experiments with plastic buttons got underway. And in the 40s, there were more advancements leading to better plastic buttons. This picture is, I think, very interesting. Uh, Fairport, Iowa, along the river, where they were trying to propagate mussels. So there was a transition period, and for those of us who were, um, you know, living in these years, I I think I remember as a, as a child those having some things with pearl buttons still, and the plastic buttons. I actually went through my button box at home uh, today, and I realized there's not a single pearl button there. It was all plastic. So in the early '60s. Um, there was a market for mussel shells that kind of developed as a side interest where mussels were used as kind of seeds in the whole cultured pearl 
industry, primarily in Japan. But by the late 60s, all these factories that had been in Muscatine and mostly up and down the river, they ceased all of the pearl button production. And poor Mr. Beckley, the, the Kickstarter to this whole industry, uh, he worked for a while at the that Fairport artificial propagation station, but look at that. He cut his foot again on a shell in Indiana and ended up dying from the infection. It's sort of sad and for him. But you know, the industry legacy, I think today as we look back and, and you come up and look at these um, examples, these items are very much sought after by collectors and jewelry makers. And they really are reminders of what was a super dynamic, but short-lived uh, pearl button industry here in the US. What about the mussels? Um, so today the St. Croix River does remain home to over 40 species, same number that existed before Europeans uh, settled here. <clears throat> but as you can imagine, uh, over harvesting and different land use changes with pollution have caused some populations to decline or disappear, except for the spectacle case. And also, not to forget the lock and dam construction impacted mussel beds um, because it kind of prevented their host fish, this herring, from moving up and down the river. By the way, um, were most of you here when the new um, St. Croix River Bridge was built? Do you remember that there was a huge effort to relocate the mussel beds? I, I remember now reading about that, that there was much time and effort put into that. So I thought that was that was neat to, to know that that effort was made. And also there have been good things, uh, especially since the Clean Water Act of 48 was made law, which enabled the mussels to come back, recolonize into some formerly polluted sites. And according to the Park Service, there's been a lot more research done on mussels since 1990 on all aspects of their life. And research, of course, continues in that realm. There are still five federally <coughs> endangered mussels from our river, and those are the five Do you think the sheep nose looks like a sheep's nose? <laughs> I don't even know what a sheep's nose looks like. <laughs> and this is the paper handout that was at the back door, that entry. Um, if I can just put in a word, if you have any interest on this in this very unique time of history in the industry. I highly recommend a couple of day trips. One would be to the St. Croix Falls, the National Scenic Riverway Visitor Center. They have a small exhibit there about this history, but that National Pearl Button Museum down in Muscatine, if you're looking for a fall trip to go down the Mississippi, that is a great city. And I really had a lot of fun exploring the museum and other things in that town. So it's well worth well worth the trip. But all of these, you know, for more reading are available to you. That is it. <laughs> and I made it. <laughs> I absolutely did not want to go over one hour and I got. Oh, I had a lot of content, but then I ended up cutting because, you know, it was, it was enough. Hopefully it went into everything. Um, does anybody want to ask any question? Oh, no. <laughs> Let's see how much I can answer. I, I just wondered how, um, what's the percentage of pearls that they find in the plants? You know, you go through a hundred plants, how likely are they to find a pearl? That 
that is such a great question. Mm -hmm. I, I don't remember ever seeing anything. I, I would say from my reading, I would say it was a rather rare occurrence. You know, this was not um, a, a common thing where they would have found it in one out of a hundred. I, I have a feeling it was a more rare occurrence. And that's why it was such a treasured find when they did come across one. But that's a really good question. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Um, I was going to suggest that the factory uh, in Stillwater was supposedly located at the bottom of Olive Street Hill, mm -hmm. uh, for those of you who are still are. Um, and by that, what's that pizza? The Grand Pizza. Oh. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where it was, I don't know if the factory itself was located there, but they used a lot of that. <laughs> they brought it up the hill, and my parents' house is located up on Hulkin Street, now. Mm -hmm. And all the houses there had had peel from the cotton factory. And so when we would plant gardens over there, we, we'd always find the the oh, Really? <laughs> That's fascinating. And I think Brent Peterson may have mentioned that somebody when they were doing a parking lot paving, like in the last 10 years, somewhere down now where you're mentioning. As part of their excavation, they stumbled upon some more of these. I mean, they were broken, you know, but it was some of the shell remnants. So that's really interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Mark yes. Rasmussen. Oh, of course, oh. did your research take you in the uh, <laughs> production of How far south? Yeah, I'm in Mississippi. Uh, Muscatine was the furthest that okay, I went. I, I originally lived by Quincy, Illinois. And, and exploring, I loved exploring. I went along the Mississippi River uh, north of uh, it's Adams County, Illinois, and I found a clamshell stretch that was probably 50 feet long by four inches deep, and they were all cut out the holes in them. And of course, I'm like, what is this? <laughs> and uh, actually, I put it together because they it's like buttons, but they just apparently there's no industry around there. Yeah. So I found it, they just found a dumping ground and left and left it all. And so I wondered how far your research took you there. Yeah. I don't even know how far Quincy is from Muscatine. Uh well, it's about 430 miles from here. Okay, South. so it's probably at least 150 from those two towns. And I'll have to look at the map. That's interesting. Yes. I was wondering um the first thing that struck me is that I was wondering if these plans were edible. I mean, the mussels were edible because in the Pacific Northwest, they were, you know, we eat mussels there. Yeah, of course, it's now commercially, you know, they, they have these things where they put the mussel seeds and then the mussels grow and then harvest them. I just thought that when they were harvesting these mussel things, I thought, you know, they boiled it and threw all the stuff away, and I was just wondering if they were edible. You know, that's that's so interesting that in all of the reading I did, I never once came upon any indication that the clamors used the meat for food. They, I, I don't know what it was. If, if maybe the smell did put them off that much, I don't know, but. They usually would just leave it or the the folks, and we saw from the licenses issue, there were farmers doing this, that they would take that meat and use it for their livestock. I did not come upon any reading that said that humans were eating this meat at the time. Yes. Do you know what they would use to um, make lips? Some of the buttons look like um, snowflakes. So I'm thinking that it's done by hand, chiseled by hand. Do you know or what they, I, I think that's too delicate for. Yeah, and I, I bet you're team. talking about, I, I had yeah, like, like this, this picture. Um, I don't want to say something that isn't accurate there, but I'm sure that this example would have been hand etched or hand cut. 
And you know, now that we're as one example, when you look at the wings of that bird, it's it's clear that someone probably etched um, the the wing indicator. So yeah. Good question. Yes. Oh, I just have one. Now, being that they mostly did um, the white ones, now today are the gray ones rare, the gray buttons rare, because they didn't make as many buttons out of them. Yeah, that's that's a segue. I'll just say, feel free to come up here because I do have a test bag for you of of um, pearl buttons, but only one in here is plastic. But there is there is some. Um, a couple that are dark mm. and that was not the preferred at that time the preferred color so you were wondering about because they didn't make them are, are they because they're more scarce now are, do people want them more because they were uh, more scarce? It, from a collecting standpoint oh i don't know that We'll just have to go down to Muscatine and find out. <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple of things. Oh, um, yeah. how were the blanks cut out? Were they stamped in a die? Do you know how they were cut? That yeah. Was like... Yeah. And I know the pictures are a little dark here. Um, yeah. yeah, they are. Um, yeah, I think it was almost um, looking here like a drill press in a way, too. Or what do you think? Yes, that's a big chicken. Oh, yeah. Okay. Otherwise, you lose your butt. Mark Rasmussen oh, is advising that it's called a hole saw. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh, a so a hole saw? H O L E? Oh, a hole saw. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> and they, I have some questions from the chat as well. Um, and, yeah, um, I'm gonna zoom back over to you. <laughs> Hang on just a second. All right, so um, one person wanted to know, or um, with a button that was had the bird uh, pattern in it, um, Mary Jo advises that that is called a Bethlehem pearl. Um, so you can look that up. Um, Mark also wanted to share that um, in terms of eating them, uh, they are considered ed edible, but not very good tasting. I guess they were, the Native Americans uh, tended to eat them more often. Okay. And then um, two more things. Uh, Mark also mentioned that second and olive is where the Century Link building is. Second and Olive. Second and Olive, where the Century Link building is, is where the factory okay. was. Good to know. And then um, Mark C. Hove, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that, um, says that I understand most pearls are imperfect and not worth much. Is that what you've heard as well? <laughs> I don't consider myself a jewelry expert by any means. <laughs> um, there's probably other people in this room that know more about that than I would. Um, do you have any sense of, I mean, I thought pearls, even imperfect, real pearls, are, are not uh, like plastic pearls that you're going to pay a good sum for a net. I don't know. I'm not sure. I mean, freshwater pearls obviously aren't as much as like a natural pearl that you would <laughs> I'm not sure within the context of this, what, you know, how, the, how those would be viewed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These are very good. Might be, might be depending on taste too. Yeah. 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 If you want more other, symmetrical. Any other questions? Oh, one more. Yes. Can you determine the age? Is it in size? Um, that their 40 year old um, muscle is gigantic compared to a 30 year old muscle? Uh, I wonder if Mark knows the answer to that. I'm sure that size is a factor because the muscles that had the smaller diameter were not the ones chosen for he, this industry. He said size and layers help determine. Okay, so the layers. <laughs> yeah, and actually, um, the ones that were passed around, I don't know if they show as well 
but this really shows quite nicely if you come up and look the layers. So that that will be helpful if you're curious about that. Um, so and with that, I'm going to invite you to come up and look at these adorable little pearl buttons. <laughs> and you know, the other place that had to, besides Muscatine was Lansing, Iowa. So that was the name of that uh, button company there. And that's on these cards as well. So you can come up and feel free to take a look. And if there's no other questions, I will wish everyone a good night and thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Have a good evening. <laughs> yeah.